Call the Thursday, March 26th commission meeting to order. First order item on the agenda is uh, minutes for March 12, 2020. Any changes? None here. None here. Okay. Next item, um, Toby Dory is going to give a recap of what's going on with the coronavirus in the city of Hayes, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'll try to be brief. I know a lot of you are getting questions about um, what are the city's plans and what does the city plan on doing and when is the city going to take some sort of action. And um, I want to make sure that you guys understand that we are not prepared right now to make any sort of action recommendation to the governing body. Um, the governor and the state of Kansas have, the governor's issued several executive orders on the uh, coronavirus issue. The most recent um, sets of orders uh, dealt with group sizes, limiting group sizes and confined spaces to 10. Um, and then setting forth some guidelines that if counties wanted to um, issue stay-at-home orders, defining what the essential uh, services and businesses were in those counties. Um, right now, we are aware of 15 counties that have issued stay-at-home uh, stay orders. There might be more. I don't know. I was trying to count uh, right before the, the meeting started. Um, I'm not aware of any cities right now that have, have gone outside of the county to issue stay-at-home orders. Um, we are in a position to where the State Department of Health um, is, is responsible for the statewide, um, you know, health and the health recommendations. And then in Ellis County, we have a, a, a health department and a health services director, and, and Jason Kennedy, who is the, the health services director, is actually here. Um, and we are taking our cues from the federal government, the CDC, from the state government, the governor's office, KDHE, and from the local health services director. And, um, you know, the, the city commission does have the ability to do something outside of what the county um, would do when it comes to this, if the city commission felt like it needed to take some sort of action. Um, but there would need to be grounds for that action. And right now, I can't tell you that we have either the scientific or the medical knowledge to recommend doing something outside of, of, of waiting to see what the state and, and, and county government or county health services director tells us we should be doing. Um, we participated at the League of Kansas Municipalities has been having uh, conference calls uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays and um, we participated in one um, Tuesday and the council for the league mentioned that um, uh, cities should avoid, it all, if at all possible, um, getting ahead of the counties in this unless they truly feel it's a localized emergency um, situation that isn't being addressed and, and that it's best to let the county um, health department or the health services director make the recommendation on stay at home. That way it's applied uniformly across all, all jurisdictions in the county. And um, I know that might be um, a little more troublesome in a place like Johnson County that has a lot of jurisdictions, you know, in proximity to each other than Ellis County where there's some separation, but the uniformity is, it does make sense. Um, so that being the case, I would be prepared to answer any questions. Uh, internally, we've been taking all the necessary precautions to protect our workers, uh, to make sure the workers are safe and they're in health, uh, healthy work environments. Um, we're doing everything, can to, everything we can to protect the, um, the public that interacts with our workers. And we're doing everything we can to ensure the provision of water, sewer, uh, treatment, streets, um, trash collection, parks, um, all the services we typically provide, utility billing, um, all of that stuff has to continue. And so we're doing our best to make sure we can continue to provide that and be prepared to provide that um, with whatever might be coming down the pike. Um, so I would be happy to answer any questions. And I know um, Mr. Kennedy is here if you would like to ask him any questions. Toby, I just want to thank you for the way you've handled it internally with our employees and staff and understanding our essential services. I think that that uh, is really important that we stay on top of that. I think it's really important for people to understand as well that we don't have a city health department or a city director of health services or anything like that. Um, it would it would almost um, it'd be wrong of us to do some of those things without the kind of information that Jason's department has or the state of Kansas provides. A number of people are reaching out to us, and I certainly understand that, and I appreciate everybody that sent an email or called. You know, we're all, we're all concerned about this, and we're all focused on it. I don't want people to think we're sitting back doing nothing. We're doing 
everything we can as a city, and I think it's very important to understand that that's essential services, and we appreciate that very much the way you're handling it. I uh, I agree with that, and Toby, I appreciate you know you giving us constant updates with you know department heads, what's going on in the community with your department heads, um, you know, and I also think we need to thank our community. You know, people are doing their best. I mean, you're always going to have some people don't you know follow rules or whatever. But you go around town, people, I mean, yeah, you see people walking, but they're not in big groups. And I think that says a lot about our community, how much they care. People are concerned. I mean, if you're not concerned about this, I think you're crazy. But it's uh, it's a scary time, and none of us have been through this. And, you know, Jason, I appreciate you being here. And uh, I guess the question I have is, as the emails we're getting, we, there are a lot of counties around us that are issuing stay-at-home Um what does it take for us to be to get there, and why are they doing it now? If you know that. So, uh, <clears throat> good evening, Commissioner it's Jason Kennedy, Ellis County Health Services. Um, I appreciate you guys having me in, and this is uh, we we truly are in unprecedented times at this point. And uh, I think the first the first point that we need to truly recognize and empathize with is the public is fearful, and and <laughs> fearful for a legitimate reason. Um, and recognizing that fear and how we deal with that fear and cope with that fear is one of the most important things that we can do. This is a real virus. It is really impacting people. It, it really does carry some repercussions from it. But at this point, um, we are not currently, we, we actually, from my office, uh, the County Board of Health, as well as Public Health Office and the County uh, Health Department, we are actually working with, uh, and really in consultation with the KDHE, with the CDC, with our um, medical health director, and the County Board of Health. At this point, we're not recommending any further um, what they actually call um, non-pharmaceutical interventions is what they're called as far as the CDC is concerned. And what that means is really any of these social distancing measures, uh, the social distancing piece, the good personal hygiene piece, um, the, the sustained closures or systemic closures that we see, and then also the uh, like stay at home orders, uh, travel mandates, all that stuff will be grouped into non pharmaceutical interventions as far as the CDC is concerned. At this point, we see no indication and the CDC, KDHE have provided us with no direction showing that at this point with no cases in Ellis County, that a stay at home order or anything like that would lead to an impactful change in the epidemiology within our community and it would not further protect the community from any spread or bringing it to the community with that at this point. Now, following our preparedness plan, we actually do have a pandemic preparedness plan. It's a fairly thick document with a bunch of different caveats in it. In that plan, where we, where we start looking at stay at home orders and further pieces of uh, closures, things like that, um, systemic closures, would be when we see that um, community transmission. So what community transmission is, is basically we have multiple cases inside our community that we can't tie to any other person outside of our community or place, location, whatever. So basically you have person A and person B completely separated from each other, two different parts of the community. Neither one of them traveled to an area that has known widespread community transmission. Neither one of them had contact with any person that was known to be positive for it. So at that point, you, you believe you have it in your community. And at that point, that's when you look at stay-at-home orders, closures, things like that, as Johnson County did after they they waited until they until they they recognized that they had that community transmission, and then they tried to socially isolate. So they're forcing that social isolation to break those bonds so that you hope to not continue the spread. Have you? Um, is it too early to know like where they're doing that in Johnson County? Has it? I don't want to say. Has it slowed it, or is it too early to even know? That? I haven't. I haven't seen any data really coming from there. Um, even New York, we're so we're so early into right. the picture of this thing as far as the U.S. You know, the the rest of the nation's been been bad, or the rest of the country's been or world has been battling it since really November December, but their data doesn't always overlay well on ours. So we we're we're so early into this process that we really don't know where it's going to go and. Um, it's something that, that I want everybody to know. I want you guys to know we, we are constantly reassessing that situation. This is something, yes, we have a pandemic plan in place, but if we see things that fall outside of that or outliers, we're going to react to those in a way that's going to do, that's going to protect the public to the best of our ability. 
that's that's our only that's what we do that's our primary focus is serving the public and then on the back side is the contact tracing piece of trying to find those pockets or where it is isolate them quarantine them so that we don't continue that spread what we got going on in ellis county do you feel like what you're seeing and if you have are we doing what we're supposed to be doing i mean do you, do you feel comfortable with what's going on you know right now or? really since uh the beginning of january we have really reached out to the community we partnered with the community as far as on the health side of things and really just community partners as far as schools and everything else to really educate and attempt to um, connect with the data and use it to make decisions to protect the public we've been following all the kdhe guidelines and mandates we've been following all the cdc guidelines and mandates um, we've obviously been uh, encouraging anyone in the community to follow the governor's um, executive orders. So I do feel at this point that we've taken steps. We've, we've followed the plan and taken steps to protect the public, and we continually reassess every single day. Um, we get information from really all of the medical community, and we also take into account, and, and I think we'd be remiss if, if any of us in this room didn't take into account the public perception. And that, and that fear piece of it. it. It really is an important piece and how we, how we deal with that and how we guide them and how we help educate them and the transparency of what we're doing and why we're doing is probably as impactful as any of the decisions we make. And engaging them as, as truly as stakeholders and saying, hey, what, what works for your organization? And so um, the, the school district closures was, was a perfect example of, you know, we all kind of had a plan. We had met as the school leaders had talked to me prior to. We had taken every step. Then we got the governor's orders down that completely changed things. So at that point, you know, that, that is a decision that's out of our hands. We all dealt with that decision. We moved forward. We continued to take steps to protect the students. Um, now we're, we're taking additional steps to protect staff and students that need to get back into the building to get um, – to, to get the uh, materials that they need to continue the at-home education piece. And so um, this really is a moving target, and it's, uh, it's so early for us in the nation. It's really early for us in Kansas, and obviously we have no cases of it currently in Ellis County, but that's something that we continually reassess. We continue to look at the data, and we, uh, we just take the, the best guidelines and recommendations that we can. Are you in contact with like Hayes Med versus Care Clinic and yeah. our medical providers? Yeah. Or are Hayes in the county? Yep. How, yeah. How are and they feeling about the preparedness of our? We meet it. We meet at least weekly. Uh, some group of that, and actually, we're um, we're partnering to uh, provide a uh, educational piece next week that will be on Facebook Live as far as from Hayes Med First Care Clinic. Um, the health department. We're all um, coming together to uh, get some docs out there that are willing to talk to the public educate the public so um, as far as on their side I don't really want to speak to how they're feeling as far as their preparedness plan or any of them but I will say that um, really across the board the community has done a phenomenal job of taking steps to protect whatever the population is that they're protecting we've the nursing homes uh, early on adopted the um, information and guidance from the KDHE to limit patient interaction Hayes Med has done the same thing um, you know we've got all the we've, we've got businesses all over town that are either closing or going to to um, a curbside delivery or something like that. You know, I, I think the community has taken its steps, taken steps to prepare itself at this point. They really have followed the guidance and the recommendations from the KDHE and the CDC. And I'll tell you what, from our side, we appreciate those steps. We appreciate people taking those steps. And I do think that people are, um, they're at least taking the social isolation piece and they're utilizing it and they're fitting it into their lives the, as, as good as they can. Um, but I cannot encourage enough and I cannot stress enough how important the social isolation piece is, which is six feet for no more than 10 minutes, and the good personal hygiene, washing your hands, not touching your face. Those, those two things in connection with each other. So Lee Norman actually did a press conference, the head epi epidemiology doctor for KDHE, really driving the bus for KDHE at this point did a press conference, and in that press conference, he said, you know, if people would do those two pieces, if they would, if they would do the social isolation and they would do the good personal hygiene, we really, he, he didn't really see that there would be a need for further draconian measures. And so that's how important those two pieces are. And so I don't think that we can stress from a governing body, from my office, from an education standpoint, from the media, from everybody, I don't think that we can stress that portion 
limit those social interactions, keep your distance, and really washing your hands, the importance of washing your hands. If you don't have that, make sure you use a hand sanitizer. Um, and the, the not touching your face, it's now that I've told you not to touch your face, you're all over there like trying to. I'm holding my hands you're, down. You're, you're wanting to, you know, but, but you don't realize how often you touch your face. And the point of that is, is you have to have a portal. You have to have an entry into your body. So if you have it on your hand, you really have to get it into your eyes, nose, or mouth to get it into your body. You can't get it through your skin. So that's why the important piece of not touching your face and, and really probably shouldn't touch anyone else's face ever either, but don't do that either. So I think we need um, those little dog collars they put Yeah, on. yeah, stay back, stay, stay back six feet. So, um, and those, those really are the important measures and the important steps. Um, you know, I will say the, the healthcare community has been um, really great at, at coming together on this and uh, everybody um, sharing resources and sharing ideas mm -hmm. and, and coming together on their pandemic plans to protect the community. For, and, and I think the key is there too is, uh, you know, we have, we talk about the essential functions. There's, there's 16 essential functions. Some of them are right here in your government. Some of them are in our business. Some of them are out there in the community. But no matter what happens in this country, those people still have to go to work. And those people are still out there serving and protecting at the same time. So I think uh, I think it's a good time to remember them and, and you know, just we're all doing our part to try and uh, to try and protect the public. If, if anyone has questions, are they able to call the Ellis County Health Department? Yeah, so um, honestly right now, I encourage anybody to call us. Um, if you have specific medical questions, um, Hayes Med has actually, they have a hotline number that they have encouraged, they want the public to call them. Um, they have, they will get them advice, they will get them to that medical, uh, that medical advice uh, much faster than even calling us. And that number is 913-588-1227, and that's their hotline. Now, if you have questions, they're, they're more than welcome to call the health department. But if they have questions about, um, more about community measures and things like that, hey, what, uh, what can I do in my business to protect people? What can I, those come to us, um, and we actually have a, uh, we set up a website, so it's COVID-19, just like you see on TV, questions spelled out at ellisco.net. If they send us an email, we can actually provide them with the document. So they can call us, and I can tell them, but if they send us an email, I can provide them with the document links to the CDC, to the KDHE. Um, we can answer their question and provide them the actual factual information that they need. That's great. Do you think it would be possible that number he gave us for Hayes Med for us to put on a I think that would be yeah. something we're, we're getting all these questions. It's almost like people don't know where to go with it. Yeah, and and Hayes Med has been great about um, they got that set up early. They've really been trying to push that out. But they're they're um, they're saying, hey, call us. They want to educate. They want to um, get that information out there to the public so that um, they they can. Well, I know for myself, we have people asking us questions. I I don't have a clue. And sure. We really don't even want to reply to the email because we don't know what to say, and you know that's something that we could get out to people and get an answer right. for them. I think would help. Yep. And then um, I can't stress enough the KDHE and the, the really the KDHE has done a good job of uh, of putting up the guidance documents. Um, we talk about the travel ma the uh, mandated um, travel quarantine, the 14 day quarantine. Um, they update that anytime a new state comes in or something like that. That's always posted on the KDHEKS.gov website. And then um, the uh, governor's website as well. Um, she has all of the all of the executive orders that are put out there are posted on her website. Um, I really encourage people to go and read those documents. And unfortunately, you can't uh, you can't Facebook read them. You can't just like read the top line because the heading never matches what's at the end. I mean, it it, it truly is like you as you read down through the document, then you get to all the exemptions, and it, it completely changes the document. But it, those are great places to start as far as um, to get a non-opinionated information. Um, they, they truly are just straight, matter of fact, and straightforward with their information. Thank you. Appreciate it. I know you're really new to the role. Did you ever think you were going to have a pandemic as your first thing <laughs> to deal with? Oh, man, I'll tell you what. It's, uh, it is trial by fire. We're learning as we go, but it's, uh, Doing you a know, great job. it's... Protecting the public is something, it, it, that's something that's not unique or new to me. Um, I spent 12 years as a paramedic prior to this, and so um, what I always say, the best part about that job is I was, uh, 
I was able to serve everyone in the public, and I never had to ask for, really, I didn't even need a name. I could go and serve them. I could take them to the hospital, and I just got to serve the public. And at this point, um, I'm back into that same role. It's, uh, I didn't have a pandemic. I'm not sure anybody <laughs> wants one of those now, but how we, how we bring that information in, how we process it, how we use it to protect the public and serve the public, and you know the, the empathy piece and understanding where they're at and that, that this is real, this is a real is thing. Real. And so um, I think that's important for all of us. You know, one thing I've been questioning, being a business owner, you know, why we're doing this, you know, delivery, you know, we had one say that you shouldn't be delivering because of the, you know, contact and stuff. But what I, what I, uh, you know, many businesses in this community are doing stuff they've never done before. And not only just to stay, you know, stay going, it's just the customers want it. You know, there's a, a Eastern, I think, never done delivery. Now they're doing delivery and stuff. And I think, I, I applaud the businesses that are trying to do what they can because it's hard. I mean, this is, this is tough. Yeah. But it's what, you know, we're all in this together and we all have to adjust. And uh, I appreciate the information you uh, are giving us, you know, almost daily. So keep up the good work. Yep. If you guys need anything, uh, you know how to get a hold of me. Like I said, the public can always call. Um, I think the key piece right now is if, if people have those symptoms, if they are seeing cough, shortness of breath, and the fever, and at this point, the travel piece. The travel piece is really important because we don't, we don't currently have it in our community. That travel piece, they really do need to contact their primary care physician. They need to self-isolate. Do not go out into the community. Do not go to the doctor. Do not go to the emergency room unless it is a true emergency. Stay at home, call your primary care physician, work with them to make a plan of how they get in. If you do not have a primary care physician, call that Hayes Med hotline number. They will walk you through the process and get you the treatment or um, testing or whatever um, that you need. All right. Thanks for coming. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Jason, so much. Next item on the agenda would be the financial statement, February 2020. This is a report of the financial summaries of revenues and expenditures for the city of Hayes, month ended February 29, 2020. Revenues in February totaled 2,729,430. That's an increase of 465,577 when we compare to the same period last year. Notable areas of increased revenue. Employee benefits was up 368,267. That's a result of the Blue Cross Blue Shield 2019 low utilization refund received. Parks Improvement Fund increased mainly due to the 6,500 from DHDC for work on the pavilion. And you may have noticed a debit to revenue for 20,240 from last year in court fines. This was due to a correcting journal entry completed at this time in 2019. And residential water consumption was down 2.6% while business was up 10.5% in February. That translates into a 5% increase in combined water revenue when compared to a year ago. And year-to-date water and conservation revenue is also up 5%. Notable areas of revenue decrease. Month-to-date golf course revenue is off 7,250 with year-to-date down only 2,900. And there will be some disparity in this line item throughout the year as we are now offering golfers the ability to pay for memberships over a six month period by ACH automatic withdrawal. And court fines are down 24,000 due simply to the timing of prosecutions as compared to this time last year. Expenditures in February totaled 2,010,172. That's a decrease of 742,680, excuse me, 685 compared to 2019. Notable areas of increased expenditure. Health insurance for employee benefits was up 171,000 due simply to the timing of premium payments when compared to last year. New equipment reserve expenditures rose 31,400 for the purchase of fire department portable radios. They are in the midst of an emergency radio replacement program. And parks and playgrounds was up 29,000 due mainly to the restock of chemicals, fertilizer, and grass seed. Some notable areas of decreased expenditure You'll notice a credit of 86745 to capital projects expenditures. This is an approved transfer from Commission Capital Reserve for design on the Vine Street 13th to bypass project. Electricity for intergovernmental was off 16450 from a year ago. New equipment for swimming pool fell 10327 due to the purchase of pool furniture this time last year. And water reclamation expenditures were down 931,000 due to the timing of the payment on the revolving loan 
We'll see that in March of this year. <coughs> Month to date, general fund sales tax collections were at 734421 That's an increase of 16000 or 2% as compared to last year. Year to date collections are at 1372984 That's up 21400 or 1.58%. And the six month average is at 5.57, which is an increase of 1.85 when compared to a year ago. The report of top 10 quarter to date sales tax collections by classification was up 175860 or 9.5%. The largest categorical increase in there was in supermarkets, convenience, and liquor stores, up 30%. Finally, the portfolio certificates of deposit on February 29, 2020, totaled $59.55 million with a weighted average interest rate of 2%, down 37 base, basis points from a year ago. The total of the U.S. Treasuries at par value is $1.477 million with a weighted average yield of maturity of 1.59%. The total balance of the money market account on February 29 was $2.25 million with a current yield of 90 basis points, and total investments are down $173,000 when compared to this time last year. I make a motion that we accept the February 2020 monthly financial statement. Second the board. Got a motion and a second. Any comment? I think this is something where you know, I'm glad we do this monthly. Does I think this is something going forward that we're really going to have to keep an eye on and just be where we're at financially because uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Because these lag a couple, we're looking at February here, so we yeah. won't know numbers for. Yeah, you know, the, the, the as far as sales tax are concerned, uh, this report is really what was collected in December. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we won't see March till May. Can you, the bulk uh, of it, anyway. Quickly explain, like, online sales, especially our big retailers, Walmart, Amazon.com, the city does collect from online sales. If they have what's called Nexus in the state, or in, yeah, in the state of Kansas, if they have Nexus, then yes, we're receiving the sales tax off of that. So if they have a salesperson here, if they have a truck, a route truck that's owned by them here, uh, if they have brick and mortar here, that's called Nexus, so they are having to pay it, collect the sales tax and pay that to us. So Amazon, um, you know, uses hundreds, thousands of vendors. Uh, there might be one vendor in there that doesn't have Nexus, then those, those items that are online wouldn't necessarily, we wouldn't necessarily be receiving that. That's called use tax. There's a tax on where the product goes, where it's used at. All, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Passes 5-0. Uh, citizen comments, we had no comments submitted, so we'll uh, move on to, I guess there's no consent agenda. Next item on the agenda would be a resolution advancing the statutory process for the Heart of America RHID. Good evening, Commissioners. Kim Rupp, Director of Finance. We're in receipt of an application for Rural Housing Incentive District, or an RHID, uh, from Heart of America Development Corporation. Their project involves the development of street and additional infrastructure uh, to serve approximately 75 residential housing lots located northeast of the intersection of 22nd and Wheatland Avenue. As you can imagine, not unlike TIF, the RHID process is multifaceted. Uh, the very first step in this process is adopting this resolution tonight, making certain housing needs findings and determinations, advancing the statutory process for RHID creation. Following adoption, if you so choose, and the publication, the resolution would be sent to the Kansas Secretary of Commerce for approval to move forward with the creation process and further commission action. RHIDs were created in 1998 to, for the purpose of which was to assist in financing of public improvements for development and renovation of housing in rural areas of Kansas. We refer to TIF a lot when we're talking about RHIDs because they are very similar. But one difference is that the RHID is based on a housing needs analysis. The report must show a shortage of quality housing. The shortage is expected to persist. The shortage is a substantial deterrent to future economic growth, and that the development of such quality housing is dependent on incentives, such as an RHID. 100% of the incremental real property taxes are captured, less than one and a half mil for the state and 20 mils for the school district. Otherwise, all taxing districts are included. The term can be up to 25 years and financed by bonds or pay-as-you-go. 
Some uses for incremental revenue include reimbursement for installation of streets, site prep, utilities, and property acquisition. However, they may not be used for buildings or structures that are to be owned or leased to any developer. This map shows the site of the proposed housing development submitted by Heart of America. So you'll see NCK to the west. Uh, this is the proposed area. State 70 is up here. So we've got Wheatland on the 22nd. Phase one of the project involves the installation of streets and additional infrastructure to support the development of 38 lots. Those are highlighted in yellow on this map. It's anticipated that the price of the homes would range between <coughs> 175,000 and 225,000. Construction of phase one is expected to begin in the fall of 2020 following the city's approval of the request and single family home construction beginning later in 2020 or early 2021. Phase one is expected to be completed approximately in 24 to 36 months thereafter. Phase two of the project involves installation of streets and additional infrastructure to support the development of 25 lots. Those are highlighted in blue. Phase two would be started when phase one is approximately 75% complete. And phase three of the project involves installations of those streets and infrastructure for the development of 12 lots. Those are highlighted in green. No specific time frame was set forth regarding phase three and its financial feasibility will be dependent on the remaining time left in the RHID. Total cost of the project is estimated to be 2743000 with all of that eligible for RHID reimbursement. The term of the RHID is 25 years with the RHID incremental property tax over the 25 years estimated to be $3.663 million. So it's anticipated that the full 25 years would not be needed. This particular project is pay-as-you-go, so the city will not be issuing bonds. The developer will be fronting all costs um, eligible for the reimbursement. This is our timeline. There are several steps in the statutory process. The housing needs analysis is complete and was included in your packet. Tonight is the resolution finding the shortage of quality housing. If approved, we'll send the resolution and housing needs analysis to the Secretary of Commerce. Their approval is estimated to be around mid-May. Uh, in the meantime, we'll be no in, negotiating in negotiation with Heart of America on a development agreement as well as preparation of a development plan. We'll be back in May to set up the public hearings on the district and the adoption of that plan. After that, the proper notices will be published and delivered to the appropriate taxing entities. And in July, we'll have the public hearing on the district creation and adoption of the plan and then enter the 30-day pro pro protest period. So that's about all I have on that. Uh, this evening options would be to adopt the resolution, decline, or provide us with other direction. Our recommendation and action is requested. I move we approve resolution number 2020-008, making certain RHID housing needs findings and determinations, advancing the statutory process for the Heart of America RHID. I'll second. Got a motion and a second. Comment? Yeah, I got Comments. I uh, conversed with Doug Williams this week. Um, last During the work session, I'd asked about the 25-year and, and how that works and who can stipulate that. And I conversed with Doug about it and because the, the original um, legislation was 15 years. And I kind of asked, you know, what was your plan if it was under that former legislation without this change? And he said, well, they were working on this project under the 15-year legislation, and what they were planning on doing was actually coming forth multiple times with a couple different 15 years, mm -hmm. where the 25 opened up for them. This allowed them to do just this one request to cover the whole um, development. And so from that standpoint, um, that's encouraging to me because I do believe it will be paid off quicker than 25 because they needed more than 15. They're getting 10 more out of it. Yeah, but they, they only needed about 20, 22, and that's kind of their, their, their thought process. So he was glad it was extended. Um, from my standpoint, that gives me some um, satisfaction that it will meet these goals instead of extending out. He also gave me, he being an old realtor, he kind of filled me in on some of these things. I wish he was here. He could certainly uh, speak for himself. Um, the reason it's 25 and they extended it out because residential properties are taxed at 11.5% of 
market value, whereas commercial properties like the TIF, and that's kind of where I was getting those TIFs are at 20, they're taxed at 25% of value. So it does take longer for a residential to recoup those costs. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a conversation I had with Doug about this project um, with those answers and, and his diligence. And there, there's not been somebody that has worked more thoroughly on a project than Doug on this project. So um, I don't have any qualms about it other than um, he, he, he filled me in on where we were on this process. So. Good info. I agree on how hard they've worked to put this together, and I think it's very needed in our community. I also wanted to congratulate Heart of America Corporation for jumping into this. They haven't been real active in a lot of things in the last numbers of years, and they saw the importance of this piece. So I want to congratulate that group as well and thank them. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 5 0. Next item on the agenda resolution calling a public hearing on the DNJ Land Development Tax Increment Financing Project Plan. Bill Kim Ruff, Director of Finance. <laughs> this agenda item is the next step in the proceedings we are in the midst of in connection with an application for economic incentives from DNJ Land and Development LLC. So you've seen several times regarding this process. Uh, this is the timeline we presented before. We've completed annexation as well as the TIF public hearing and ordinance. We're now asking for a resolution setting a public hearing on the project plan for state statute. In addition, two weeks ago, we presented the TIF project plan to the City of Hayes Planning Commission. They unanimously agreed that the project plan is consistent with the intent of the comprehensive plan for the development of the City of Hayes. This map represents the developer's rendition, what they call phase one. It's 11 lots. The developer will construct a travel plaza and truck wash on the two lots. The remaining lots will be sold or leased to end users for potential development of hotels, restaurants, or other commercial uses. The project plan before you is basically the summary of the project, which includes the project descriptions, costs, funding, feasibility study, and other legal requirements provided for by statute, as well as our own economic development policy. According to the city's economic development policy, the TIF district will capture the incremental taxes only, no, no sales tax. All taxing authorities will receive their own retailer sales tax generated by the property. The TIF is 20 years, according to statute, and will be pay as you go. So the, developer will be, the developer will be fronting all the financing. You've seen these before. They're a part of the project plan that you got. Total construction costs, travel plaza, and truck wash is $22.4 million. Upon sale of the development lots, the development estimates the appraised value of the phase one improvements will be $50.7 million. They also estimate uh, annual sales of $38.7 million and $3 million of monthly gas and diesel sales. Over the 20-year life, the TIF is expected to generate $14.9 million in ad valorem property tax revenue and the reimbursement of TIF eligible costs would be about 12.4. That excludes the one and a half from the KDOT grant. The feasibility study was prepared using financial projections formulated by the developer. The study shows that if the project develops as expected, the estimated TIF revenue combined with CID sales tax, the KDOT grant, the developer's private debt and equity will be sufficient to pay the cost of the reimbursable expenditures in the project. Feasibility study also called out some benefits to local economy, which include the creation of 263 jobs, an increase in the hotel room capacity of the city, a needed regional travel plaza and truck wash, and an increase in sales tax revenue. And finally, the Wichita State University Center for Economic Development calculated a benefit to cost ratio of 1.66 for the city of Hayes as it pertains to the full build out of the project. So tonight your options are to adopt the resolution calling for the public hearing on that project plan. That action keeps the project moving forward. You can decline or uh, give us other direction. So our request tonight is to approve the resolution. I'll move to approve resolution number 2020-009, setting a public hearing date of May 14th, 2020, regarding the adoption of the DNJ Land and Development TIF project plan. Seconded. A motion and a second. Comment? Uh, Toby, I know this is a couple of months away, but are we thinking how will we be doing a public hearing if it is limited, still limited to 10 people? 
Um, right now we are exploring electronic options um, for public hearings. Um, we have, uh, as with public comment on agenda items, um, we can make special notifications um, if there are specific properties or people we have to notify and to the public that you could submit your public hearing comments or questions ahead of time. Um, one of the things we actually talked about just today, and it might have been Colin and I, um, was anybody that was interested in participating in the public hearing could come up to City Hall. We could put them in sort of a queue area where they could maintain their space, and then they could come in one at a time and, and offer comment to the governing body so as to not overwhelm the overall the room. So right now I'm not sure, but we're, we're exploring different options. Okay, thank you. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Passes 5 0. Next time on the agenda, a resolution calling a public hearing on the D and J Land Development Community Improvement District, CID. Last time tonight for me. <laughs> the developer, D and J Land and Development, has submitted a petition to the City of Hayes to create a community improvement district or CID. They have also included the application for economic development incentives and fees as required by the city policy. Before we get into the petition, I thought we'd review CIDs real quick. Uh, they were enacted in 2009 to help cities promote business activity and economic development. CIDs are designed to be a special assessment and or a special sales tax on retail sales up to 2% maximum for no longer than 22 years. CIDs are used to help property owners reimburse themselves for public buildings, infrastructure, parking, landscape, and the promotion of tourism and recreational cultural activities. To be clear, these are not sales tax that already exist. They are an addition sales tax on retail sales at the defined property. So basically, if something the landowner or developer wishes to have them, it's, it's something that the uh, developer or landowner wishes to impose on themselves to help the reimburse for items mentioned above. This is a map of the property that you've seen numerous times. The red hashed area is the proposed CID, which encompasses the travel plaza and truck wash. DNJ is asking for the imposition of a 2% CID sales tax to help in the construction of the property. The proposed improvements include installation of buildings, landscaping, lighting, infrastructure, utilities, and sidewalks, installation of parking lots, and methods of ingress and egress. Those are all consistent with the development of commercial property within the authorized zone for the property. Total estimated project cost for the travel plaza and truck wash are at six million. To be clear, this is the CID portion, six million, with 4.3 of that eligible for CID reimbursement. The developer has projected that 2% CID on the district will generate 2.92 million over the 22-year life of the CID. Again, it is a pay-as-you-go scenario, so the city will not issue bonds on the project. Those will be privately funded up front, up front by the developer. State statute requires a public hearing regarding the establishment of CIDs, so your options are to adopt a resolution setting that public hearing, decline to move it forward by, decline to move it forward with the resolution, or provide us with other direction. This is our action requested tonight. I move we approve resolution number 2020-010, setting a public hearing date of May 14, 2020, regarding the creation of the D&J Land and Development Community Improvement District. Second. The motion and second. Comments? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Passes 5-0. For all the negativity that's going on in our world right now, a couple items that we passed tonight, I think we're going to see a lot of positive things in the future of the city of Hayes, and I'm very excited about that. Next item on the agenda, legal notice publication, proposed charter ordinance, allowing the City of Hayes to publish official notice via website. Good evening, Colin Belzer, Assistant City Manager. Um, this agenda item is recommended as a way to make publications less costly to the taxpayers and increase publication timing and efficiency. So recently it's become more difficult and costly to publicize ordinances and other legal notices in the Hayes Daily News. State statute does require a city des to designate a newspaper as the official city publication. Currently, that is the Hayes Daily News. Um, however, the governing body can adopt a charter ordinance, which would allow by resolution at a later time for the governing body to designate the city of Hayes website as the official publication for the city. This action does not preclude the continued use of newspapers and other printed outlets if you so desire. 
So some considerations, as I no, uh, noted earlier, there's been some staff reductions, which has resulted in some design and sizing um, discrepancies. Uh, recently, a publication was increased in size, which increased in cost to the city without notification. Another example was a uh, county seal was placed on a city publication. Um, and so those mistakes are unfortunately happening. In addition, some ordinances and zoning requests require a public hearing, which those are, of course, are timely. Um, and in order to help that process by having it on the city website, that speed and efficiency would make that uh, process much easier for both the city and the applicants if it was a public hearing. Obviously, this wouldn't tie us into an outlet that is charging a fee. Other cities have uh, passed similar charter ordinances. Inman, Kansas is already doing this. McPherson recently passed a charter ordinance. Lenexa, as well as Baldwin City. The average annual cost for legal publications is $9,400. So a charter ordinance, Hayes has adopted 27 of these. They must be adopted by two-thirds vote. They're published twice in the Hayes Daily News. And then there's a 60-day protest period before it can become effective. If during that protest period, 10% or more of the electors file protest, then the charter ordinance must be submitted to a vote. What staff is recommending is we would create a newsflash uh, uh, template or uh, option uh, for legal publications. So anytime a legal notice was uh, distributed, it would be placed on the front page of the website underneath city news. Citizens also have the ability to sign up for certain news flashes. So if a citizen did want to sign up for news flash legal publication, they would be sent an email as soon as that were distributed on our city website. They can click the more information, and obviously this is a template, but uh, the actual language of whatever the legal notice would be there. Uh, additionally, what's nice about this option is the publications would be able to remain on the website for more than just one uh, publication in the newspaper. So the options are you can approve a charter ordinance allowing the City of Hayes to publish official notices via the website, do nothing, or provide staff with other direction. And our action request is approve charter ordinance number 29. I'll make a motion that we approve Charter Ordinance Number 29, allowing the city to publish official notices via the city website. Second. A motion and a second. Um, I will say I like this because we're saving taxpayers money, quite a bit of money. And you also, I'd ask for you sent a graph last week of just what the second week in March, and we had about 20, 2,200 hits or whatever you call that, or visits to the mm -hmm. homepage. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Is that the right word? I think you did good. I don't know what I'm saying here, but <laughs> seems like a lot of people. Clicks. But it's, uh, clicks. There you go. Clicks. clicks. But uh, I mean that that's that's pretty big, and I I'm assuming by the end of the month probably it'd be close to four thousand, maybe. I, I don't know how that usually works, but that's uh, I think that's a pretty good number. So I I think it's a good move. I like having everything in one site that has to do with the city. I think people will get used to using that. Um, as I expressed last week, I just want to be sure that we have good communication letting people know where it's going to be. And the big thing is that they can sign up for that notification that, that sends them a notice. And I make that as easy as possible for our citizens because that I think people will use that. I use it. I like it a lot. So It doesn't prohibit us from using the paper, though, right? You, okay. could, you could so continue we, to also use it. We still feel like we want to, for whatever reason, publish it on the paper. We can and will. Yes. My second question... Um, we have to designate a paper. Does that preclude, so like Hayes, um, Hayes Post, because they're not a newspaper, is it, would we be considered using them to publish notices? They are considered a newspaper. They are, and then if they drafted this, it's intended to, to take such populations. And so um, it doesn't mean we would use it. Well, I'm excited about it because this way, 24-7, people can, when they have time, they can check. We just send them an email if they sign up, and 24-7, they can go and look at this thing and reread it and send it to their friends or whatever so that uh, hopefully we'll, we get less of this. Well, I didn't see it. So I'm definitely excited. The notify me tab on the page is very easy to maneuver. So you can also sign up for other things besides these notices, which is a great tool to use. 
very handy. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Passes 5 0. We had progress. Colin Belzer, Assistant City Manager. So for the last month, <coughs> Stormwater maintenance has performed annual inspections of the city's floodgates. So on the right, they are testing those. There are nine locations, um, and all were found in good working order. They also inspected the sandbags, and those are on the left. They do a visual inspection, and then they also drop those from a feet or a height of eight feet to make sure they're still in good condition. Uh, sandbags have a shelf life of at least 25 years, and we have approximately 80,000 sandbags on hand. Hopefully, we never have to use them. The uh, service division did replace 81 yards of concrete um, on East 9th Street in the 300 and 400 blocks of, of 9th. They cleaned out the levee on Gustad, I'm going to call it, Drive. Um, so this is on FHSU campus. What it required is damming up the flow. They had to clean out the silt and video, send a video in there to make sure it was uh, functioning properly. There were multiple individuals, uh, stormwater, service division, water resources, and private contractors involved in this. This is something that's required every five years by the Corps of Engineer, and future inspections will be the responsibility of Fort Hay State University. Another uh, project they did is they replaced 16 yards of concrete to reconstruct the alley entrance at 25th and Fort. And the fire department uh, the fire department recently received training from the fire marshal's office regarding fire flow and fire truck access road code requirements for new construction. This uh, course was hosted by the Manhattan Fire Department. Firefighter Travis Johannes completed all requirements to become a certified aerial driver and operator. This is a 32-hour training course. They also conducted a spring vehicle extraction training drill. They do this twice a year. As you're aware, with the uh, project with Downtown Hayes, the, the Parks Department constructed a gravel parking lot near the pavilion. They also did various sidewalk replacement in parks. This is in Seven Hills Park, and you can see it kind of heaving on the left, so they went and re-poured that section. They installed a new golf cart path uh, at the golf course to provide improved access from the course to the north parking lot. Frontier Park, they took time to clear an unsightly area that included two dead trees um, and installed a new golf basket location. It's the one, I had to call, make sure, but it's the white one in the back, so not the red one. But you can see that area is definitely cleaned up. Informa Information Technology Department updated the tax jurisdiction boundaries to ensure appropriate tax rate for areas. And the de police department officers Mason Seary and Derek Crisenberry graduated from Kansas Law Enforcement Training Center. Officer Crisenberry was elected class president. He is on the left. Uh, Officer Seary is on the right. The Water Resources Department held a basics of buffalo grass. Uh, you might recall Holly Dickman came in and uh, informed you of the new rebate program we have with buffalo grass. So she had a presentation at the Hayes Public Library on March 5th. Staff, uh, including myself, got the opportunity to go visit the R9 Ranch. We also took uh, K-State Grassland Specialist Keith Harmony along to um, uh, view the native grass and how that's coming as we transition that property into its native habitat. And the water resources, they also, Patrick Jones and Alan Lopez, uh, potholed to fix a top side of a meter. So they were there to put in a new meter, um, a portion of the pipe was compromised between the main to the meter and they had to, to replace that little s section while they were trying to update the meter. It's an older meter, older pipe, so sometimes they're very ginger. Uh, reducing the meter at Big Creek Crossing, it was a two inch meter and it was requested by the mall or Big Creek Crossing to downsize that to one inch meter. CVB, they assisted with the Wild West Festival fundraiser dinner on February 22nd. That included a, a raffle, sign auction, um, live music, and a dinner. They also took time to make a marquee sign database. This is obviously very helpful when uh, big events come into town. As you can see, Hickox on the right, they welcomed wrestlers coming into the state uh, wrestling tournament. 
It also took an opportunity to update the photos for the websites and future marketing materials uh, with Sternberg Museum. All the photos were taken by CVB employee Brandon Cooley. And what was nice is they were able to take advantage of the school's early release day on March 11th, so we were able to capture a lot of the young the youth at the museum. CVB, um, or Melissa Dixon with the CVB attended a trip to Pittsburgh with the Town and Gown Committee that has representatives from Grow Hayes, the Chamber, Downtown Hayes, uh, and obviously Fort Hayes State University to explore Block 22 project. This was a project that they learned about at a conference for uh, university and city relations and it was right in this state so a delegation did go attend to uh, see what Pittsburgh's up to on the picture on the left is the block 22 buildings as they're under construction the right is actually a rendering but uh, that is how it turned out after speaking with Melissa other people that went included Doug Williams um, Sarah Bloom uh, representatives from the county Project Man at I-70 waterline crossing, that's progressing where we're putting in a new 12-inch water main connecting the north and south sides of uh, Hayes underneath the interstate. This also includes a booster station just east of 41st and Post Road. 10th Street is under construction. Morgan Brothers has started that. They've already done some uh, uh, replacement of concrete. There's some waterline work that we've uh, uh, started and it's on schedule to be completed by May 1st. And lastly, the airport, they had some damage at the canopy uh, during a windstorm, and we were able to get that repaired and installed some new LED lighting, so it looks really sharp. And that's for that month. Thanks, Colin. I see Melissa here. Melissa, could you answer a couple questions? You always like to get questions when you're here. If you want to, yep, yeah. We love that you come, by the way. I uh, just had a couple questions. I really appreciated that you participated with the Wild West Fest on their fundraiser, and I wondered, I know they had their, some challenges and are continuing to work on that. How was that fundraiser? Did it turn out good for them? They, it was profitable. I don't know if it was worth as much trouble as the group put into it, but I think they'll evaluate for, for next for year. For next year. Yes. And I was, I was really excited and sad that I wasn't able to go to the trip to Pittsburgh. Can you give us just a couple highlights? I love the town and gown concept, I think. You guys are continuing to grow that, and I think it's really important for our community to have that kind of collaboration. But I'm interested in anything exciting that came from Pittsburgh. Um, it was great to see the comparisons between our two communities, similar size universities, similar size populations, uh, similar housing challenges. Um, and they were so kind to hook us up with uh, city manager, deputy city manager, mm -hmm. housing director. Um, but then there were some um, positions that we do not have, <coughs> maybe a a chief strategy officer for the university. We don't have one of those. Or a director of special projects for the university that were really focused on economic development in the community. Um, and we got to meet the chief investor for that Block 22 project who told us uh, um, that they made it happen, how they made it happen with uh, some new market tax credits that um, incentivize economic development for, for investors because they get a big tax credits in the end. Very it good. Was very exciting. Very good. Well, thanks for all of you for attending and yeah. taking the initiative to do that. You bet. Thank it. you. Thank you. Commissioner Mellick. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the essential workers that are keeping Hayes uh, going during this uh, difficult time. And I especially would like to put a big pat on the back for all of our city workers. They are all very essential. They're keeping city government running, they're keeping Hayes clean, uh, water, sewer, you know, trash, uh, just kudos to, to our city workers for getting up and coming to work every day and keeping us uh, going forward. Uh, and everyone do what the CDC says and be safe. Mr. Burgess? Yeah, I'd like to make a, a personal but public statement. Um, I'd like to see the county sales tax pass. Ballots are in the mail now. And again, from a personal standpoint, I, I believe this strongly. The city of Hayes is in a great position and the spotlight is on Hayes with some of the great things. We talked about them tonight with the truck stop and new businesses, um, the, new, the housing projects, there's other housing projects. Um, the 
the state's looking at us at water and, and how we're handling these things. And I really think the city is in a, an opportune position to really shine for other communities to look at what we're doing. And when I think about that, um, something that could dim that light, in my opinion, is if, if the county can't maintain roads, can't maintain emergency services, um, if the county is struggling to meet their budget, um, to me, in the end, that's going to pull down on Hayes uh, more than I'd like to see it um, happen. So um, I know there's a lot of everything else on everybody's mind right now, but I did want to make that as a public statement. I'd be happy to answer um, to anybody that has questions on why I'd support the, the county sales tax. Thank you. Mr. Weaver? Uh, I want to kind of echo uh, Commissioner Mellick's uh, statements. Uh, I do want to commend the community in general, too, uh, on everything they've done above and beyond. It seems like a lot of the business owners around here uh, and the people in general are doing a lot of uh, research and a lot of uh, putting good measures in place to keep themselves and their families and their businesses safe. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to reiterate what Jason Kennedy, Ellis County uh, Health Services Director, said. Um, to go to the KDHE website, kdheks.gov. They have a huge green button right when you open it up. It's real big. Uh, it's their resource center. It's got up-to-date maps, information from KDHE, everybody. I mean, it's got all the information you could possibly want. No bias, just facts. Um, and then go to the CDC's website. You can type in cdc.gov slash coronavirus, and it pulls up all their resource information as well. Um, I say that as I touch my face. <laughs> Didn't realize how much I did until they start telling me, but I, I'm, I'm really trying. If you knew how much I touched my face, it's really hard. But uh, Me too. <laughs> you just got to continue to do the what they call the five, you know, wash your hands as much as possible, cough into your elbow, don't touch your face, uh, social distancing at least six feet apart as much as you possibly can, and stay home if you are sick. Um, you, you may not be sick as well. You could potentially be a carrier, and you might not know it. So make sure you're not looking out for just yourself, but your your fellow community as well. Um, and education to your children, especially now that they're home, is super important. Um, I know my wife's daycare is really big on cleanliness as well, but really getting them, especially now that she has a few school-age kids with her, it's the continued... 20 seconds washing your hand with soap and warm water up to the elbows, singing happy birthday or doing the ABCs, whatever it is to get you the 20 seconds. Um, just letting them know that this is important, not just because it's something we do, it's to keep everybody safe. Um, and then if you have any questions, continue to call or email us and reach out to your uh, Hayes Meds hotline or Ellis County Health Department or anybody else you need to contact. Uh, I echo everything the other commissioners have said. I, d I think this social distancing thing is a very, very important part of this process from everything I see and read. And I think in communities that are really practicing it, they're already starting to see that this will make the difference. Um, for our community to do it on their own uh, is a really big deal. I'd like to encourage uh, one of the other commissioners mentioned, you may not be sick, and you may not have anything wrong, but you could be a carrier, and you could be giving it to somebody else if you're causing crowded activities. And I think there is still some of that going on in the community, and I hope people would rethink it just a little bit. Um, we'd like to get through this as easily as we can. We, uh, As Commissioner Burgess said, we have a really bright future and have amazing things going on in this community. We certainly don't want to mess that up. So as I appreciate everything our community is doing. I appreciate them reaching out to the right sources and taking care of each other, because I'm sure seeing a lot of that going on. Absolutely. I uh, want to echo uh, Commissioner uh, Burgess, your comments about this um, county tax. Um, you know, I know I was at one of the meetings with you, and we kind of both heard the same thing. You know, we're all in this together, and, um, you know, the city's in great shape, and we need the county to be in good shape for us to move forward. And uh, I hope people will really consider that and see how it will affect all of us, if whether they get that uh, sales tax. Um, and I'd also kind of echo what everybody was saying. Just I want to first of all thank all the employees what they're doing, continue doing. I mean, the employees of this community or this city is just unbelievable from the top down. And um, and also the um, the way uh, hmm. 
the way uh, the residents of this town are supporting uh, local businesses and just, you know, even uh, retail workers. I mean, Dillon's, Walmart, those guys have been through total hell. And um, just the continued support, people going out of their way to uh, just hold this community together. And this community is a great community. Once this gets over with, we're all going to be much better for it. But it's uh, just thank everybody and uh, keep up the good work. We're adjourned.